Let's kick it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to part 2 of what's new in 22.6.7 If you haven't seen part 1 yet, then I'm sure there's a link to it over here somewhere Damn, missed it again In this part, we'll be looking at the system restore's actual restoration which is new for this build as well as the first difference between personal and professional builds So let's get on with it Another thing that's actually new in this build and not a bug is system restore actually restoring things. I said in the last build that it comes in in this build and it does and so I will show you. If we open up a command prompt to yeah, red server 32 because remember we have to do this because it doesn't do it itself and it succeeds and then we go to it's called I can't remember what it's called I see Best point, that's the one. Oh, no. C script. Gonna go. Yep. Spelling's never been a strong point of mine. And if you try running the scripting thing, which we had from the last build, you could see that it says it could not locate auth could not locate automation class named SR client dot system restore. Now even though we registered the client DLL it didn't quite work and if we go to the registry again we can see that if we look under here there is no such thing as SR client if we get down there nope there's no such thing as SR it'd be up here wasn't it it's just spelling wasn't one of my strong points there you go it'd be, it'd be between those two and it's not there so what gives well in this build Instead of the scripting interface which they built up for the last build, they completely junked all that stuff and they went to a WMI derived interface. For reasons unbeknownst to anybody, but they obviously weren't writing in C++ because that's a hell of a thing to do from C++, WMI. So yeah, if we open up WebM test, then you want root slash default and you can open up the Class they made, it's not system client, it's system restore, and you can see all the features of their class, all the attributes, that's what I'm after. You can see it's got a name, a number, a time, and a type, so it's pretty much all the stuff that was in the script interface. It's just now within a WMI interface. And there's also a method you can create a restore point, disable system restore, and enable system restore. Now, unfortunately, to manipulate these, you need instances which are obviously entries of system restore but if you click on the instance, instances button you get a provider load failure so even though it's now a WMI interface it's a broken WMI interface and you can't use it so they took it from something which works to something which doesn't quite so yeah that's a bit of a, a downer but something I did notice is that if you go to, no actually not, not first, I'll show you this first, if you go to Windows and it's in System32, in Restore, there's actually a GUI which will do the System Restore for you. It's not just a file list now, there's all this other stuff in here. And if you click on this RST RUI, then you'll notice that nothing happens. You can click on it all you want, and nothing happens. Now that is because, by default, system restores restorability is disabled again I don't know why that is maybe they were just afraid of testing it yet or weren't quite up to testing it yet but you can create restore points now if you well actually you can't can you because it doesn't work so there's no way to create re well you can you can use a C interface can't you you could use a C interface to create restore points but you can't actually restore them yet until you go to here we are. Yep, as you can see, there's this entry here called Disable Restore in HKLM Software Microsoft Windows NT Current Version System Restore, and it's set to 1. Disable Restore set to 1. So if you set that to 0, 
So that doesn't just enable that tool from working, which it does. As you can see, it's the Windows ME tool, which hasn't been redesigned or anything. We'll come back to that a bit later on. Anyway, what you, what it also opens up is if you go to Computer and Properties, and you wait a little bit, we now have a new tab up here, and it's the System Restart tab. System Restart tab. Now you can obviously turn it on and off, and you can select how much disk space it uses. Now there's a minimum here of 200 megabytes, and it only goes down to 50 percent. But if you really wanted to change it, it's set to here, disk percent, which is 12 percent, and 12 percent of two gigabytes must be. If that's not right. Well, anyway, whatever. The maximum is 400 megabytes for some reason, and it's set to maximum. But you can set it to what you like or disable it. Yeah, so. You anyway, with all that set up, you can now run this tool and it will either restore your computer or it will create a restore point. So, why not? Let's create one, why not? Restore point description. My rest point, because imagination is not one of my strong points. And there we go, that was quite quick, it created one. Now, if you want to restore a restart point, I can't remember if this is how it worked in XP or not, because I only used it once or twice. But yeah, if you restart it, and then what it does is restart your computer, and then when it logs back on, it should have restored the things. So we'll wait for that to happen. And when you log back in, this restart incomplete things. I don't know if it should say incomplete or success if there's nothing to back up or nothing to restore anyway. But anyway it says it cannot be restored and no changes have been made. And then and that's it. So I'm not really sure if that should be a failure or not, but anyway. One thing you can't do from this thing, which we couldn't do from the scripting interface, and we can't do from the WMI interface, is actually delete a restart point. There's pretty much no way, no GUI way to delete a restart point. At least I don't think there is. This um, tool does actually import the function to delete a restart point, but I don't exactly know how to do it, because right clicking on these doesn't do anything, neither does double clicking, so there's no menu to be invoked delete key doesn't do anything so I'm not really sure how but anyway yeah this tool is straight from Windows ME so there's nothing really interesting about the tool apart from the fact that it's disabled by default by that registry key now the stuff it backs up is no longer in a restore folder shut up you under oh don't click on that it's no longer in the restore folder hidden restore folder under here it's now in system volume information now by default if you try clicking on that, you won't be able to get in because users don't have the security to get in there, it's just system. So what you need to do is add a key for your user or users in general. Then you can get access. Now these aren't. I don't think these are. Yeah, they're set to everyone I think. So you get in here and then you can see there's actually quite a number of restart points in here. I don't know where they all came from, I haven't run it that many times. But yeah, they're, they're all the same things in as they did in the last build. Cryptically named resources. That one didn't have anything in it, as you can see. So yeah, it's just, that's the restore point functionality. That's, you see the first one there's got quite a lot of stuff in it. And I was messing around with it. Let's just do a test of that tool to see if it will restore back to the earliest restart point. So that should be a good test of it. I've created a snapshot in the virtual machine, so that shouldn't be a problem now. I think that was one of the reasons I was holding off doing it, because I slipped my mind that I could do that. So I didn't want to destroy all the stuff that I'd done. So anyway, yeah, let's pick the first one, and that'd probably be there. So, let's see 
let's give it a go. And here's the moment of truth. And it hasn't worked. So now we know why it's disabled, because it doesn't work. In the interest of fairness to command line options, there's a new thing from the command line and you can now run a program called Shutdown and that obviously shuts down the computer or a remote computer and it can take a timeout so you can set it to shut down in a while or you can set it to shut down right now. But yeah, that's new in this build, the shutdown tool, so now you don't have to when you run a batch script you don't have to get the user to manually run shutdown, you can just type in shutdown in your batch script and it will shut down the computer. Yeah, another weird thing that I found is in Netshire. And that is uh, the net well, it doesn't tell you there's not about there, but it's actually a shell for network interface operations and stuff like that. I don't know how to really use it, but that's pretty much what it is. And the weird thing is if you type in, when I find in my notes where it is, um, there we go. If you type in set file and then the options command, you at the top of it, it prints out this weird text here. It says original shell.rc number four, there's shell.rc number five, yours shell.rc. Now this is static in the resources so this isn't dynamically generated like it's not a version of something or other that's just static text that somebody wrote in the resources and this end bit as well yeah as we can see in the last build it wasn't there at all as you can see there's no thing along the top there so that was added to this build for some unknown reason and its purpose is unknown so it's just one big unknown I feel like Donald, Donald Rumsfeld here. A more substantial new thing in this build is in the key manager. Now you may remember this from a couple of videos ago where I logged onto a network share and it saved the key in here. Yep, well this now has some, the DLL that implements this has some new functionality. It's not in this, you can't get to it from here. So what am I on about? Well, you'll see in a minute if I type in show pass wiz, I think that's not what I called it. My notes are wrong because that's not what I called it. It's oh Mr. W off the, the name. And what it is is now you can back up your password. And it says back up your password. It's not really a password backup. It's more of it, like I said, it's more of a key to unlock your account if you forget your password. So, because if you do this, then you change your password. You can still use this um, information that you save. And I, I think that's how it works anyway. So there we go. Type in my password, and you press next, and it does a little bit of well, a bit of computation, and then you can save a these PSW files. So I'll just call it pass. And it tells you, whoa, you should really put this on a floppy disk so you can take it somewhere or a USB thing, but you haven't done that. Do you want to do it? Do you want to save it on the disk? And you can go, yep. Obviously if you save it on the hard drive then whoever else uses the computer can just nick your key and log into your password. Log into your password, log into your account. So that's not a very nice thing to do. But yeah, it went there's a backup password and as you'd expect there is a reciprocal to that, uh, that's replace the password. And it says it can use your special key file to replace the password. So then what you have to do is find the file it saved. And then you type in a new password. This can be the same as the current one in this case. But if you'd lost it, obviously you wouldn't have a current one because you wouldn't know what it was. And it says the password has been replaced and you're all sorted. So yeah, that's some new functionality, in, new functionality in the credential manager, which is what it's now called, not the keyring. The surprises in the credential manager slash keymanager.dll don't end there though. There's a little fun thing in the resources. It's actually an 
a wow icon. Yeah, you know wow, don't you? Yeah. You've probably all played it, and when I find out which one it is, it's 300. Aha, I fooled you. You weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> but yeah, it's not actually a wow icon, it's just a literal icon that says wow. And if I don't type passing, I've done that one. If I open up, make it a bit bigger, you can in fact see it's there's a wow on a grey background with a pink slash magenta background for that, yep. Like I said, it's not used in the DLL as you'd expect because they wouldn't show something like that on the UI. God forbid Windows had any personality. But yeah, that's not shown. And it exists in there for some unknown reason. Like I said, it's not used in the code. So you wouldn't see it otherwise. Now, 2267 brings the first major distinction between the personal and professional builds. It's not really anything you well, it's not something you'd see on a, d a regular basis, but if you run, no, it's not, yeah, it's go to MMC and then you go to add remove snapping and use when your mouse isn't acting up, you go to add and then local users and groups and you can add that and you can select it and open it and play with it and everything's fine, right? Yeah, well, this is the professional build. If we go to the personal build, aka the professional build after I've done my little trick, and you try and do the same, then you now get this dialog. It says this computer is running Windows Personal. This snapping may not be used with that version of Windows. To manage user accounts on this computer, use the user accounts tool in the control panel. So as of 2267, you can no longer run the local users and groups snapping from MMC on your computer. Now I don't know precisely why that is, it seems to be like a, a, a moronic thing to disallow access to considering, you know, it's just a out of the way thing that really um, personal computer users aren't really, <laughs> they're not really going to be using that. I mean, how many home computer users do you know who go, oh yeah, I need to just take a trip into MMC and look at some of them. Not many. So yeah, that's one of the main differences, obviously apart from the text on the desktop, <laughs> between the personal and professional builds. Another thing which doesn't work in this build that used to work is fast user switching. And if you try and log off, it just says, oh, should I want to log off? And that's because the registry value, you need to enable it. Allow multiple TS sessions value defaults to zero. Now you can set it to one. And then you can switch user. But then if you log on to any account, also this doesn't, typing in the keyboard now doesn't kill, doesn't get you the blue screen. So that works for that. As you can see, if you refresh it now, it goes back to zero. So every time anybody logs on, it gets reset to zero. So it's quite hard coded now that you can't actually do that and have multiple TS sessions on the same computer. So even though this is the professional version, if you want, of the operating system, you can't actually have fast user switching. So that's something you could do that you can't do, which you will be able to do again sometime in the future. Another thing that I don't really want to dwell on too much is there's some changes to the way CD burning is well not performed, but if you just get to the CD drive now and try and paste some files to it and it's not a writable drive, you now get this error box. Error message box says it can't copy it because these files are read only. You idiot. So then what you do is obviously if you enable recording on this drive, now there's a different way to do it in this build instead of the drive number under the explorer key instead of cd recorder drive here with a number of the drive letter so like 0 is A, 1 is B and so on now you it's a separate key for cd burning and under there you have to add the volume ID of the cd drive which in this case is well as you can see another GUID and what you need to do to that is add a supported key underneath it and that will make it show up in the UI 
and obviously then you can enable it. And then as you can see there's already some files that I've pasted onto it and now you can actually paste onto it as well. And what you can do now I can actually show you is what happens when you write to a CD. And you see it brings up this progress dialog. It says initializing initializing CD image file and that's the stash imappy file that's in the C drive. Oh, it's a model dialog so I can't show you the file right now. Yep, and it says the disk is full, please insert a disk with more free space and try again. Yep, like I said, this is only a read-only virtual box drive, so I can actually run through the whole sequence of it. But it pretty much just it pretty much just be the progress bar ticking up. After the last build where Notepad got a slight lick of pain, another of the inbox utilities decided he wanted one too. And he was the registry editor. Now he already had a status bar on the bottom and it was a bit useful so they couldn't do that so instead they gave him the ability to load and unload registry hives now a registry hive is pretty much just a binary blob of registry data it's unlike these normal reg files which are text files it's a collection of binary data so you can't really edit it yourself but what you can do now is load it into regedit and then edit it from there and then if you unload it after you've edited it it will save the changes into the file where you originally had it stored. So if we load the registry hive which is created after the first stage of setup, because you can't do it on the software and security files because they're in use by the registry, obviously. So if we use software.sav, which as I said is the one created after the first stage of setup, and then it's not really used again. So we can use that one. So if we open up that and find it again, it gives you. A, you can put in a key name, so it's um, backup, for instance. Then you now get a new key under HK Local Machine, and that's backup. And as you can see, it's a standard software key which you get. Now, if you made any changes to that, and then you went file unload hive then it would reflect all the changes you made back into the, the registry file and then obviously you could do whatever you want to do with that and load it back up again on the other computer which is probably what it's used for to edit things for other computers because there's no real obviously these are already loaded the default ones so you don't need to edit it oh, anyway yeah so what else you can do he didn't also didn't just get the ability to do that. If you look through these um, the hardware keys and get these red resource list of, um, values, you don't normally see these in the normal registry. But if you go down the hardware key, you do, and then you now get these this little dialog. And it says it's about these are um, kernel side resources that are actually physical resources on your computer so not virtual memory it's like things like interrupts and parts and stuff like that and as you can see here this is interrupt to 12 level 12 and it's a latched interrupt so that's a resource that's available on this computer well on this virtual machine that nobody's claimed so yeah it's, you can do that for reg resource list values you can also do it if I find the right one, I think it's that one, no, not that one, not that one, no, it's description, that's one. I think I'd actually plan this advanced one, yeah, there you go, if you get to these reg full resource descriptors, you just get them straight away, you get them, but that's not, that's an empty one, so there's no in there to actually see. And what you can also do now in regedit is if you go to view, there's a new display binary data option. And that just lets you look at the binary data of any type of value, rather than just reg binary. And you can, uh, you can't edit it from there. I don't think. No, you have to right-click on it and go to modify binary data to edit it like that. So yeah, regedit got a few new options. There's another thing in this build which has been bubbling for several builds now, but only finally it makes it to the surface and that looks like its final XP apparition is this. Now in the executable shortcut properties in the advanced dialog there's you can now select run as a different user and when you do that you get a new 
item on the shortcut menu, which is runners, and that's now the default option. So if you just click on the shortcut, you get this, which again looks like it does in Final XP. And we now have a new checkbox, which means you can run it as yourself, but under a protected, well, in a protected form. And this is basically the restricted tokens of the user token, so it's like a primitive form of UAC. And it's been bubbling for several releases because this is based on the safer technology. So good luck googling that, putting safer windows into Google. Yeah, so it's uh, safer technologies. It's a bunch of APIs to do with code behaving well, basically. And anyway, it says this might cause the program to function improperly, but it should be improperly with an M. But it's not, but anyway, it says function improperly, and that's because if you try and run it, it doesn't work. It says a required privilege is not held by the client. Now I don't know what privilege that is or why it's required, but if you set that on any pretty much any executable shortcut, it will say that. So it's not quite ready for prime time just yet. Because it doesn't quite work by default. Like many of the previous builds, there's also some weirdness going on with the resources in some DLLs in this version. Now specifically, we're looking at the Cert Manager DLL, which is the Certificate Manager, and within it, amongst the new resources for this version, that's all these under the RT version, is this group of group icons. Now what you get when you open them up is a bunch of letters. So there's one which is an L. There's one which is a slightly different L. There's a H, and lastly, there's a U. Now, these aren't used in the code, so I don't know what they were intended for. But the best guess I have is that somebody from Microsoft took a holiday in East Yorkshire, in England, and this was a memorial of their trip to Hull, so they spelt it out in the resources. That's obviously a load of rubbish, but that's the best I can come up with. There's one other fun thing in the resources of this version, and that's in DWWin, which we've already seen put up the crash dialog for the blue screen, and it's dialog 101. And what this is, it's an assert dialog, so when something that shouldn't be happening in code happens, this box would pump up, pump up, pop up even, and it says, hey you, please put the four letter assert tag in the assertion field in red if you're into a bug. Thanks. Now, I can only think that RAID is some sort of internal bug tracking software, so, well, system, because it doesn't make sense in the disk configuration sense. So yeah, this would pop up if a condition happens in code that shouldn't be happening, like if something was zero when it should be one, then they put a bit of code in to check that, and if it happens, then this would pop up. And obviously you can see they can debug the program, or ignore it, or quit, and all that stuff. System Restore is also responsible for a little bit of weirdness in this build. Now I don't know how it determines which folders it keeps an eye on, but in this case it's keeping an eye on my bits folder. So if I copy an executable, say WinObj here, and then rename it so it doesn't have any spaces in its name, and then create a shortcut to it, obviously it works fine, shortcut, problems there. And just to show you, there you see, the target of the shortcut is obviously the .exe file. So if I delete that file now, there you go, it's completely deleted. Now obviously this should now wor not work because it's been deleted. But if you click on it, it still works. Now why is that? Well, in Explorer, broken shortcuts um, get, well, the Explorer searches for similar sort of files to, see, to try and fix the shortcut and in this case it did just that and it fixed it by pointing the shortcut to the system restart folder where this certain exe file has been collected. As you can see the shortcut has been updated as well as the starting to point to the system restart folder so that's why it works. So like I said I don't know how system restart does this collection I mean it must just keep a watch on the folder and if there's any new folders then it copies it obviously to the restart folder but yeah so it's a little bit of weirdness there to do with the shortcuts and it keeping files it probably shouldn't be keeping 
That's also why it was so notorious for restoring malware because it used to copy the malware and put that in the restore folder and then when you did a re restore it copied the malware back to your system. So your system restore was never the silver bullet it was meant to be. The last major new thing about 22.6.7 that's new is on the command line and it's the disk part utility. Now unlike FSUtil, even though it's only version 0.3, so nowhere near ready for prime time yet, it's actually quite functional compared to FSUtil, which crashed all the time. So if I list the disks that, and spell it right, then yep, you can see I've put an extra hard disk in here, which is only 4 megabytes, just to demonstrate this. Now, what disk part is, is pretty much just a command line front for the logical disk manager MMC snapping they both do the same thing they use the same tools underneath I have to select the disk first before I do that so yeah it's just like a command line front end for that and if we create a partition a primary partition we can see it's subject to the same agonizing weights and bugs that that's subject to you see creating a, part, a primary partition on the new disk it hasn't been initialized or anything so I also didn't get a pop-up when I started the computer about uh, the new disk that I found no hardware wizard or anything so that's also not in this build or maybe just use the drivers it already had up set up for the original disk but either way as you can see it's taking quite a long time As we can see, if we open up the task manager, oh, as you can see, the task bar disappeared for some reason. Don't know why that happened. But yeah, if we go down here to find disk part, there's also should be DM admin. That's the dynamic disk manager administration tool, which actually does all the work of the snapping and disk part as well. So you can see he's working away and waiting for something. And eventually we can see it's finally created the partition and it took quite a long time. But what the disk part can't do is actually initialize the disk. I don't think it can anyway. Um, nope, don't seem to be able to. So what happens now is since I've created a partition but not initialized it, it's in some sort the disk is in some sort of Franken state. Whereas if I go to here, you can see it's not listed under the local drives quite yet. And if I open up the disk manager snapping, then we get the initialize wizard. Even though if I move this out of the way, you can see it has actually has a partition on it. And since it doesn't have a drive letter, I can't format it or anything. So yeah, this part it can create partitions, it can create other sort of stuff and most of it actually works so even though it's not point version not point three it's more stable than FSU tool was when it came in. So yeah that's the last new thing in this build. If you're still watching then thank you for watching and I will see you in twenty two seventy six. The build not the year.